All right? So let's look over at chapter 11. Verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, for the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not, uh, were not made of things which do appear. By faith uh, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he attained uh, witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by, uh, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he, that he should, uh, should not see death and was not found because God had translated him uh, for before his translation, he, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without fa uh, faith, it is impossible to please him for he that uh, cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not, uh, not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a, into a place which he should uh, he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed and he went uh, he went out not knowing whether he went, uh, whither he went by faith he sojourned into the land of promise as in as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Ibra, uh, with Isaac and Jacob and the heirs with him of the same promise for he looked for a city which uh, hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Therefore, uh, uh, though sorry, through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of, of a child when she was past age, because she judged uh, faithfully who had promised. Therefore sprang uh, there even of one, and him as good as dead, so, uh, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the uh, sand which is by the seashore in, innumerable, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen uh, them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed them, that they were strangers and pilgrims on, on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Verse 15. And truly, it, uh, if they had been mindful of that country from whence uh, they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now uh, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly, uh, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith Abraham, when he was tried and offered up, sacri uh, offered up Isaac, and he, uh, he that had received the promises offered up uh, his, uh, his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, according uh, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the, uh, even from the dead, from whence also he received uh, him in a figure. By faith, Isaac and uh, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was a when he was dying, uh, blessed uh, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of a staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of of the children of Israel, and gave commandment concerning his bones. By faith. Uh, when he, uh, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was uh, come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater, uh, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. 
By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he, does, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept uh, the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he uh, that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, which the, uh, the, which the Egyptians assailing, assaying to, uh, to do uh, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down, after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab perished, not with, uh, not with them that believed, uh, that believed not, when she, uh, when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall, I say, uh, what shall I more say? For the time will fail, uh, fail me to tell of, of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of uh, Jephthah and uh, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through uh, faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword out of weakness, were made strong, waxed vigil, uh, vigilant in battle or in uh, fight, uh, turned to uh, flight the enemies of the aliens. Women received their dead uh, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others uh, had uh, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report, through faith received not the promise, God having uh, provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I ask that you would fill me with your spirit uh, this evening. Lord, uh, that, uh, that you would uh, use me, Lord, uh, that you would give me clarity of thought, clarity of mind, Lord. And Lord, we ask that this, uh, this evening, Lord, that we not only hear your word, but we would... Uh, do your word as well, God, that we would follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so as we, uh, as we have read that, obviously, a, a lengthy, chap uh, lengthy chapter about this, you obviously see the Hall of Faith. You, you'll see every single person that is mentioned in there is in the Hall of Faith. That means that they are in heaven for no matter what, they, you know, what they've done. Why? Because, I'll tell you this, is because they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will say, how is it possible that they are in heaven when they did that? Well, you know what? We're not the judge. God is the judge. And the thing is, is that if the Lord says that they're in heaven, I believe them. So number one is this. What is faith and who is in charge of your faith? Now, in the, first, uh, in the first verse that we can look at is that we see, you know, it kind of gives us a definition, gives us the, uh, you know, the sphere of faith. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If we go back, you know, if we were to go back into chapter 10 and look at verse 38, it, well, and 39, but mainly the, the beginning part of verse 38, it says, now the just shall live by faith. Now, ju the just shall live by faith. But obviously, the definite of faith, you know, of faith is obviously in verse 1 of this chapter. It looks, you know, a little bit like this. Our faith, our trust, our belief in Jesus, right? We have a, we, we, we put our faith in Jesus even though we haven't seen him yet, right? We put our faith, our trust, our belief in him because we haven't seen him yet. Just like our faith, our trust, our, uh, trust, our belief is in his salvation, even though we haven't seen the fullness of, their, uh, of it yet. You'll say, well, what do you mean? We're not in heaven yet. And so faith is that thing that we believe in. But, uh, you know, we put our faith in the Lord. Why? Because we believe who he is and, uh, you know, who, and who he says, uh, the, uh, says that he is, which is God, and we believe in his word, the Bible. That is, that is how we know, that is what, what we are putting our faith and our trust in, is that who he says he is, that you know, that what his word says that he is, that 
we believe all those things that he is God and that his word is in the Bible, right? That we know that what God wants us to do is in his word and that's how we live this life. That that is our manual, that is our, our way of, uh, our, our map, if you, want, uh, if you will, for life. That's how we go about living life is through that. Another, uh, a per, another person put it this way, the essence of faith consists in, live, uh, in receiving what Jesus what, Je- or, sorry, what God has revealed and may be defined as that trust in the God of the scriptures and in Jesus Christ whom he has sent uh, which receives him as Savior and Lord and impels, uh, impels to living, uh, living obedience and good works. And so in other words, it's the fact that you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are following you know, what the Bible says. We believe what the Bible says to be true that that God is Jesus Christ. Amen? And so, like I said, faith is the fact of things that we haven't seen yet, and yet we still believe, right? Because we have not seen Jesus. Nobody has seen Jesus yet. And the thing is, is that, you know, so so let's go on, you know, to to verse, you know, 2, and the fact that it talks about the elders. It says the elders received a good report from who? From Jesus, uh, you know, from the Lord, from, you know, the Word of God. Why? Because they received it, uh, the elders are speaking of the prophets and of the Old Testament saints. They were witnesses to the things which happened, obviously, in the Old Testament. Those would be the elders, and they received that good report from the Lord. Why? How, or, sorry, not why, but how it was that they were moved by the Holy Ghost to write down the words of God. If we look at verse 3, verse 3 speaks of, let me go back to it for you. I was a little bit too far back. Verse 3, through faith we understand that the words uh, were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not, uh, were not made of things which do appear. In other words, God is in control of all things. Even when we don't, uh, we don't always understand what or why things happen. God is in control of all things. God is there to help us through those trials and tribulations. We may not understand it. We may not understand it this side of eternity. We may not understand why we go through things here at all. But we'll probably, I would assume that, you know, that we'll find out when we're in heaven. And the thing is, is that will we really care when we get into heaven? Because you know, some things that consume our minds here of saying, why, why does this happen? Why does this happen? Why does this happen? By the time we get to heaven, I think personally we're going to be like, "Who cares? I'm here. I'm, I'm in the presence of the Lord." That's why you know, to me, it's like uh, you know, I've heard people say, "If I'm married here, will I know my spouse there?" And this is not a flippant statement, but you're not going to care. To be honest, you're in heaven. You're with the Lord, right? There's no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering. None of those things. And, you know, they're like, but I love my spouse. I understand you do. But hopefully you love the Lord more. And when you get there, you're going to say, you know what? doesn't really matter. I'm glad they're here. That's all that matters, right? And so when we look at these, you know, at, you know these first three verses of, you know, uh, what, what is faith and who is in charge of your faith? Well, we know that faith is things that we have necessarily seen. But here's the thing is, who's in charge of your faith? Jesus Christ. He's the one that, that lead, guides, and directs us, or he should be the one who leads, guides, and directs us. Number two is this, Old, Te- uh, Old Testament witnesses of his faithfulness. Old Te- uh, Testament uh, witnesses of his, uh, of his faithfulness. Now, every single person that is mentioned in the, you know, in the following verses, I probably will not talk about you know, in depth about what they did or else we'll be here for a while. There's quite a few people named in this chapter. But I'll give you like a, a little, you know, a synopsis of, you know, what they went through. Verse 4 it talks about Abel. It says, Abel's faith showed his, uh, you know, showed his faith by what he brought to the Lord. What do we bring to the Lord, you know, when we, you know, say come to the house of the Lord? Or what, we, what do we bring? Oftentimes people say, I bring my best gift when I come to the house of the Lord. Well, do you bring your best, say, work when you go to work? Do you bring, you know, your, your best for you know, other situations that would glorify the Lord. And you say, well, how would me bringing something to somebody else bring glory to the Lord? Well, if it's in your work, the Bible says that we're, we're supposed to work as unto the Lord. 
And so those things there, you know, uh, you know, show people our faith is the fact that we, you know what, we believe God and we trust God. Am I saying that you got to like, if your child wants a, a BMW to go out and buy him a BMW? No. It's also a thing called common sense. It's the best of what you're able to provide, right? Not every single person in this room can, you know, can afford, you know, a BMW or I wouldn't even say like a Lamborghini or something like that. But why would you ever want to get your kid a Lamborghini in the first place? I wouldn't want to get him a BMW because you know, I'd be afraid that thing was going to be scratched within the first like week or less. And they, yeah, they definitely need a job and they definitely need to be paying for their own insurance and all that. Especially if you get them like a Lamborghini, I can guarantee that insurance is going to be sky high. So don't do that. But anyways, if we look at verses 4 and 7, look at verses 4 and 7, it says, For it is impossible that, uh, or I am looking at the wrong, oh, there we go, sorry, verse 4 says, uh, verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was uh, righteous, God testifying of, of his gifts, and by it he being uh, dead yet speaks. And then, sorry, verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned of, uh, of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, uh, prepared an, uh, an ark to the saving of his house, by, uh, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And so when we look at those two, we see two words or uh, two descriptions of believers. He says he was righteous. If, uh, if the Bible says that person is righteous, they are saved, right? Or they're an heir of righteousness, means that they are saved. These are attributes only given to believers. They don't give them to somebody that's kind of on the border. No, they're ones that are actually saved. We see this in Romans chapter 3, verse 22. It says, even the, righteous, uh, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and unto all them that believe, for there is no difference. In other words, he's saying, you know what? If you have the righteousness of God, you're saved. All right? It, it, it's for those who have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans, te, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. How simple is that? You say, you know, that seems pre, you know, uh, pretty simple, but you know how many times people will argue the fact that that's not you know, how a person is saved? And yet that's how the Bible says that the person is saved? Because when you believe unto righteousness, what does that mean? You're saved. One man wrote it like this. He said, righteousness here means that righteousness of God, which is judicially reckoned to all who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, believers are the righteous. Believers are the righteous. Let's look at Enoch real quick, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated, which in other words means taken away, that he was just poof, gone one day. And it says, and he appeared no more. He was translated to heaven, and he never physically died. Why? Because he pleased God. He pleased God. And so when we look at those, you know, at those situations, well, you know, some of us are going, how can I please God so I can be translated right up into heaven? I think the only way that that's happening now is when the rapture happens. That's another way of looking at the word, you know, uh, translated is, in other words, we're just going to be, you're going to be here one day, the next, pff, gone. Paul breaks down, you know, uh, he breaks down his examples by what their faith shows. In this first, you know, in this first uh, portion, what he is showing us, what, uh, you know, in this instance of, of, of faith is that we please God by our faith. So in other words, what does that look like? When you come to God, believe that he is God and that he rewards those, uh, those who seek what he wants, not what you want, but what he wants, okay? And so that's what we're seeing from this first section of believers that he's going through. When he talks about Enoch and he talks you know, about Abel and those ones, is that they please God, how? By believing that he's God and basically, and they're not. And that, you know what, that when we believe that he is God and that he rewards those that he loves and that we do what he, what he wants, he's going re, to reward us for that. Number three is this. How does he reward his people? 
I'll give you a couple of examples. This, this is going to be verses uh, 7 through 16. They said, well, Pastor, this is, you're going through bigger chunks of this. Well, you know what? There's a lot of, you know, a lot of things, a lot of things to hit. So, One is a long life here on earth. Did you know that a person who lives long on this earth as a believer, that's, a, you know, you're being rewarded of the Lord, you know, for being faithful. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the tablet or uh, upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. So God does reward those that if you're a, you know, a believer, he's going to give you a long life on this earth, okay? That, that does not say that, you know, that if a person had a short life just because of some sort of random accident or whatever, that means that they're a heathen. It just means that that was one of the things that he promised, um, you know, overall. Number two is obviously life everlasting, that, that, you know, eternal life. We all know that, that if we're a believer, that he's gonna re he rewards us with heaven, with eternity, right? The third one is heavenly rewards. We actually get rewards in heaven for what we do here on this earth. Obviously, we don't do things on this earth so we get rewarded, but we, you know, God says, you know what? I want you to do good works. I want you to do these things, and I'm going to reward you for them. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. For other foundation uh, can no man lay than th that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest or laid bare or out in the open. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward, and if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now realize that, obviously, what things are on there are going to be burned. Wood, hubble, st uh, you know, uh, stubble, and hay. I tried to combine hay and stubble and made it hubble. That's a, that's a giant telescope. Wood, hay, and stubble will burn. And the precious, you know, the precious things like gold, silver, and precious stones are not going to. But, you know, and so he goes through and he says, basically, you're going to be rewarded for the good things you do and some of the stuff that's not so good and it, as you go along. But the part that always catches me on the, uh, on the fact is, is that people will say, well, not a, you know, can a person get into heaven without having you know, rewards? Yes. You can get into heaven without being rewarded, you know, rewarded for your good work. You know that? And some are looking at me like, are you sure? But it says, if any man work shall be burned, what happens? He shall suffer loss. That means, yeah, he doesn't have anything to show for, but what does it say? But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by the fire. So in other words, he's still saved. He just didn't have any rewards, you know, to, to go up to, you know, to the Lord and say, here you go. Let's look at verse 7. Verse 7. I want to make sure in this one because, because for some reason, okay, yeah, it is right. All right. I want to make sure that I had the right person that I was writing. But, uh, in verse 7, by faith, uh, Noah's faith in the Lord. We're talking about Noah now. He not only saved his family, but like I said earlier, he's called an heir of righteousness, which is, which is a son of God according to John chapter 1, verse 12, which says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. He received heaven, life everlasting, as his reward. That's what, it's, that's what it means, that he was an heir of righteousness. He got into heaven. I think so many times people say, well, I just want to get into heaven, and that's it. Do you know how great of a reward heaven is? I mean, it's, 
some people say it so flippantly, like it's not even actually like a real place that they can go to. They're like, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to heaven. Heaven's going to be amazing, I'll just tell you that. Heaven's going to be amazing. And so in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 17, it says this, speaking about heirs. It says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so, uh, if so be that we suffer with him, that we, all, uh, that we may be also glorified together. So just because you suffer on this earth, the Bible says, if you suffer on this earth, you're still going to be an heir, heir with Christ. The thing is, is that oftentimes people think that if they're suffering or going through some persecution, that somehow they're, they're doing it wrong. I would argue that you're doing it right. Because if, you're, if you are suffering persecution for righteousness' sake, you are doing it right. Now, the thing is, is that I, uh, I remember this, this, uh, there was a, a pastor that came in one time, and he was telling a story about this guy that said, hey, I suffered for Jesus and for righteousness' sake. And the guy said, well, what happened? What, you know, how do you know that? He goes, he goes, oh, I was beat up for Jesus. He says, well, how did that happen? He says, well, I went into a bar and I began to tell people about Jesus. He says, and I was, you know, uh, and I was beat up. He says, well, what did you say to him? He says, well, I told him we're all going to hell. He says, and then they, then they started, like, you know, punching me, beat me down, and then they threw me out. That's called stupidity. It's one thing if you want to go, you know, uh, you know, if you want to go tell people about Jesus and everything else, but probably the best possible way is probably not, you know, starting off the conversation with you're going to die and go to hell. All right, there's other ways of, of going about that. Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, it says, And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So if we're, you know, if we are believers, we're a part of Abraham's seed, in which the Bible says that you're heirs to the promise, which is what? Eternal life. Let's look, at, uh, it, let's look more in depth at Abraham, speaking of him, in verses 8 through 10. Let me read those, uh, those verses. By faith Abraham, uh, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, after uh, receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and when, uh, when he went out, not knowing whither he went, by faith he sojourned into the land of promise as in a strange place as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So Abraham, by faith, obeyed, and not only, not only did he receive an earthly reward, which is the land of Israel, but also a heavenly reward, because he was, because he was obedient, because he desired to do what Jesus you know, had for him. All right, verse 11, it, it speaks of his wife, Sarah, it says, through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. When it says she was past age, it wasn't past age, but like a couple of years. She was 90 years old when she gave birth to Isaac because the Lord had promised her that that was going to happen and he never lies. All right, he never lies. And what does it say? You know, the rest of us is because she judged him faithfully who had promised. And then in verse 12, you keep on talking about Abraham and Sarah. It says, uh, you know, Abraham and Sarah in verse, uh, sorry, verse 12, it says, Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. In other words, it says, you know, obviously that the Lord is faithful and true, and he told Abraham that, he, uh, that through his seed that he would be the father of many nations. He said he's going to be the father of many nations. If you want to read about it, it's in Genesis chapter 17, verses 4 and 5. But that's what, uh, the promises that he made because Abraham and Sarah were faithful and they were believers in the Lord. And so God said, I am going to do this for you. Here's a little re recap of this portion that we see here. In verse, and this is, you know, I'm going to summarize uh, verses 13 through 16, which is what the Lord promised. Even if you die before the promise is fulfilled, it will be fulfilled. If, the Lord, if God has told you something, it will happen. If it's truly from the Lord, it will happen. 
So keep praying for those lost family members and those you know, lost friends and those enemies you know, that just get your goat every single time that you're out. Pray for their salvation. Because the thing is, is that you may not see their salvation, but the thing is, is that the Lord said that they're going to be saved. They will be saved. I remember the Lord, you know, saying that about my family. I didn't always sit there and believe that, you know, that the Lord was going to save my family, and he did. He told me. I doubted a lot of times. Maybe that's why it took so much longer, because of the fact that I doubted, because I was trying to reason with them why they, you know, you know there are so many reasons going through my mind why they wouldn't be saved. You don't understand, Lord. You don't understand this. I tried to explain God, you know, why it's going to be hard for him to save them. But we know that God, you know, will do that. Number four is this, prepare to be uncom- uh, uncomfortable. Prepare to be uncomfortable. Verses 17, uh, uh, 17 through uh, 19, I'm going to go over here. We again are seeing uh, Abraham, you know, going, uh, going through these things where it says, by faith Abraham, when he was tried and offered up Isaac, and he that had uh, received the promises offered up uh, his own only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that, uh, accounting that, uh, sorry, that God was able to raise him up even from uh, the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. So we look at this, and the fact is, is that obviously, would that make anybody uncomfortable? The fact that God says, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something amazing. I want you to go up there, and I want you to offer your only son. I want you to kill your son because I asked you to do it. How many in this room would sit there and be like, I must have eaten something bad last night. I've had, you know, I, that can't be the Lord. Or am I the only one that would probably sit there and, you know, and kind of argue with him and say, I don't think that's right. I think that's, you know, a wrong thing because God would never ask me to do that. Well, he asked Uh, it, it's a possibility. It is definitely a possibility. But God will ask you to leave your, your, uh, your comfort zone or your comforts and trust that even when you don't understand what is going on, he knows what's best for you. He knows. Do you think that Abraham and Isaac forgot that? I mean, do you think that there was times that they're sitting around you know, the dinner table and, and Isaac's sitting there and you're like, well, there was that time, Dad, where you tried to kill me. And then he comes back, well, well, God told me to. I mean, just going back, I mean, just think about that. I mean, it's one of those things that, that you sit there and it's going to, you know, it's not going to just be a one-time thing, but like, oh, yeah, sorry, my bad. God provided, you know, a ram in the thicket. And remember, you know, what, what God, you know, or what, the, you know, what was prophesied there also is that he said that God was going to provide a lamb, right? And what did God provide? Not a ram, or sorry, not a lamb, but a ram. And so it was a partial, it was a, you know, a partial prophecy being fulfilled in the fact that God did provide a sacrifice for that situation for Isaac to not be uh, to not be sacrificed, but it was also obviously a foreshadowing of what Christ would you know do and be in the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then we see in verses 20, uh, 20 uh, through twenty two, by faith Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph blessed others even though they knew what would happen. The sons of Joseph were Ephraim and Manasseh. One put it this way, it says, Observe here in, the di- uh, in, in dying Jacob, the frame and carriage of, of holy men in their, uh, in their uh, dying and seasons to bless their children and worship their God. Jacob blessed Joseph and his two sons, laying hold on the covenant made with Abraham. It was no small privilege to be born of parents taken uh, taken into visible uh, covenant with God, and no small comfort when God comes to take away such parents from us to, uh, to have the benefit of their blessings and prayers. Jacob, when dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph, and, and as he blessed them, so he worshiped God with, uh, with worship and devout manner, leaning upon the t- top of his staff. And the part that, you know, this person, you know, that said this, you know, makes the comment about the fact of taking away your parents because they know that uh, they know what's coming and the benefits of the blessings of the prayers that they have prayed. 
I believe that the reason why God has, at this point, and you know, just using this as an example, the reason why America has not been completely judged yet by God is because of the, the prayers of the saints that have gone before us. I believe that's the only reason why God has not just poured out his wrath upon America is because of the prayers of the saints beforehand, the blessings that they were uh, there before. Verse 23 uh, speaks of uh, Moses' parents, that they hid him for three months because they knew the Lord would use him, so they went against the government command and lived by faith. They could have died by the fact of them you know, hiding Moses and everything else. Why? Because the government asked them to kill their children. It's not always a bad you know, time to go against your government. Because if it's not a righteous government, they're going to call for evil and wicked things like they did in this situation, you know, the murdering of the firstborn son. In verses uh, 24 through 29, it's again about Moses. The fact that he refused the commander-in-chief of the king and chose affliction rather than sin. The Bible says that he chose uh, rather affliction than the pleasure of sin for a season. Do you know that sin actually is, you know, does feel nice, is nice, right, for a season? Everybody, I mean, the, the devil, you know, could not get you to do something if he said, you know what, do you know how wicked and evil this is? No, he's going to say, don't worry about it. Nobody's going to look. It's going to be great for you. You know what? You deserve this. You need this. This is what you've always wanted. Why? Because he wants you to sin. He wants you to do it. So the thing is, is that we need to realize that no matter what, that in this world, rather than uh, us being shamed or disgraced by the world, we should say, you know what, I'm going to follow God no matter what. The world's going to you know, try and do that no matter what. They're going to try and point their fingers back at us anyways. And the thing is, is that in times where we need to, I'm not saying that we should just go out of there and start speeding and, and doing whatever we want to and saying, you know what, I, I'm, I'm following my own laws because I'm following what God told me to do. I don't need this police officer telling me what to do. Did I say No, I did not say that. Because the Bible also says to ob- uh, obey the laws of the land, Basically, until they cross over and then they go against what God has commanded us to do. Sorry, speed limit is there for your protection. In verse 30, uh, we see that the Israelites are made fun of. Uh, I mean, they're, they were made fun of, they were ridiculed, they were mocked by those that were in Jericho until the walls came down and then the Israelites came in and destroyed them. I mean, if you've ever seen Veggie Tales and Josh on the Big Wall, which is definitely not accurate, obviously how the Bible says it, but they were making fun of them in that movie when, they, when the peas were throwing over slushies at the, at the Israelites, right? But anyways, they were ridiculed and mocked. Why? Because they saw this great fortress that they had, that the people in Jericho had, and they were sitting there like, there's no way, there's no way you're going to take this place, especially by walking around it for seven days. But the thing is, is that on the seventh day, you know, when it came down, the walls came down, and they, uh, and they went and they destroyed it. I think that they were singing a different tune. Verse 31 talks about Rahab. I want you to realize that so far, and actually in all of these situations, you will never see, you don't see in this entire thing what they did bad, do you? The only time that you see it is her, when it calls her a harlot, which is a prostitute. That he's like kind of talking, you know, he's talking about that situation. But the thing is, is that it's, a, it's in a good light. He's, you know, he's, like, he's not saying that being a harlot's a good thing, but he's like, you know what, uh, that she uh, obeyed at the point of being, uh, at the risk of being killed, yet was saved because by her faith she believed the Lord. She was a prostitute. She believed on the Lord, and the Bible says that she was saved because of her obedience you know, uh, to believe on the Lord. And then in verse 32, you see a whole bunch of different names that, you know, some of them you, understand, you, you know, other names you don't know, like Gideon, Barak, uh, Samson, uh, Jephthah, 
David, Samuel, and so it talks about the prophets. These were all, they were all mocked, they were all shamed, they were all ridiculed for their faith, yet they stood up for their faith even when they were standing alone. Most of the times the prophets were standing by themselves when they made their declarations and told, you know, things that they're standing all by themselves. That takes a lot of guts, doesn't it? That they stood up in no matter what. But Gideon, who by uh, faith in God, with 300 men, destroyed countless multitudes of Midian, uh, Midianites and Amalekites and delivered Israel from oppression and slavery. If you want to read about him, Judges chapter 6 through 8. Now Barak, he overthrew uh, uh, Jabin, the king of Canaan, and delivered Israel from, uh, from servitude. That's in Judges chapter 4. Samson, a lot of you know, you know who Samson is. He was appointed by God to deliver Israel from the oppressive yoke of the Philistines and by extraordinary assistance discomforted them on several occasions. There's many a times where he just irritated them. He also irritated his wife, Delilah. She'd come over and ask him, where do you get the source of your strength? And he'd tell her, he'd tell her all kinds of things until finally you know, she just wore him down and then he, just, he, he did something stupid and told her. So it's never a good idea to marry somebody that's not saved. It's never a good idea. And if you're going to use the excuse, well, I'm going to um, win them for Jesus, I'm going to see them saved because I married them, good luck. Now, Japh uh, now Japheth, he, uh, he was under the same guidance as as uh, Samson, but he deleted, uh, sorry, he defeated the, uh, the, the Ammonites and delivered Israel in Judges chapter 11, through, uh, 11 and 12. David, obviously, most people know who King David is. He's king of Israel, whose whole life was a life of faith and dependence on God, but whose character will be best seen in those books which contain an account of his reign in the book of Psalms, to which the notes there the reader must be, uh, must be referred, it is probable he re is referred to for his act of faith because of the fact of what he showed towards Goliath. There's other times where he goes out to battle and everything else, and he does, you know, a, a lot of great things um, in that. If you want to, you know, know about the you know, story of Goliath, 1 Samuel 17. Samuel, he was the last of the Israelite, or the Israelitish kind of judges because there's a little a bit of mixing between races uh, there. To whom succeeded a race of kings, of whom Saul and David were the first two, and were both appointed by this guy. And so, if you want to read about him, uh, read about him in the first book of uh, First Samuel. That's uh, where he is located, all at. And so, then we go to number four, or sorry, number five, which is this. What, uh, you know, what believers may see for their faith in Christ. What a believer will see for their faith in Christ. Versus, this is verses 33 through 39. Let's read that. <coughs> Who through faith subdued uh, kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed vigilant in battle, turned, uh, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their, their dead, uh, re received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting uh, deliverance that they might attain a better resurrection. And others... Had, uh, had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were, sl uh, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and, and caves of the earth. And these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. In other words, the promise they're talking about is the things that they were promised, they did not see while they were alive. They saw, you know, those things were fulfilled after they died. 
But here's the thing is that even though that they suffered for their faith, they knew the sufferings would last only would only last but a moment in light of eternity and the eternal reward by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. They knew that if, if they were going to be persecuted, if they were going to be put to death, it was only but for a moment. Even the fact if somebody is, is tortured for the faith for 20, 30 years, in light of eternity, that's a short period of time, right? They knew, uh, they knew those things. That, didn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were happy with it, that they were like glad about it. There was, I mean... You think you go back to Elijah, one of the prophets. He actually, you know, prayed that the Lord would take him. He said, "Lord, just take me now. I'm done with this." But the thing is, is that they knew uh, they knew it. And the thing is, like I said earlier, did you ever notice that that in this portion of scripture, the Apostle Paul never brings up what they did wrong for their sins, only what they did by faith. Were any of those? If were, any, were any of those that were mentioned in chapter 11 perfect? I mean, you read about it, and you, you sit there and go, well, man, you know, it doesn't seem like they did anything wrong, right? Except I guess a little bit about Rahab, because it you know, labels her a harlot. I mean, the thing is, is that by no means it was anybody in uh, chapter 11 perfect. Nobody was. They all did their things. I'm going to read you some of those things that they did. Noah had children through his daughter-in-laws. Sarah laughed at God when, he told, uh, when God told her that she would uh, give birth to a son at age 90. Jacob tricked his brother into giving him his birthright. Moses killed a man. The Israelites countless times backslid from God. Rahab was a prostitute. David killed a man after he had gotten the man's, uh, the man's wife pregnant. Samson told his heathen wife the sources of his strength, then had his eyes gouged out, made a, laugh, a laughing stop, then committed suicide by asking the Lord to restore his strength by, uh, by giving him, uh, restoring his strength and pushing the pillars over to take out those that mocked him. And the finally, you know, finally, the prophets were, and it talks about the fact that they were stoned to death, that they were sawn asunder. You know what sawn asunder is? That they were sawn in half. They were tempted, they were slain with a sword, they wandered you know, about in sheepskins and goatskins. I mean, think about it, that's John the Baptist, pretty much. John the Baptist was the one going around you know, eating locusts and honey. And then you, uh, you look at the other ones, you know, talking about the fact of the mouths of lions. Who's that that stopped the mouths of lions? Daniel. Who's, it says, quenched the violence of fire. That could be, you know, uh, Madrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So he's talking about all these ones that, that had these, per- that none of them, you know, none of these ones in here are perfect. And so in other words, when we read Hebrews chapter 11, we shouldn't just sit there and go, man, I am such a slacker. I am not perfect like these because of the way that, you know, he writes it, you would sit there, you know, and obviously this is the way that um, some people believe that Luke is actually writing down what the apostle Paul is preaching. But he's going through, and he's only mentioning those things. You know why? It's because in light of eternity, that's what the Lord is seeing that you know, happens to you. By faith, he sees all those things that you do for his glory. You're not, it's, it's not you know, uh, you know, that God's like just sitting there going, you know, like my old view of God, which was you know, have a magnifying glass, and you're that, that little insect, that little ant, that he's sitting over there trying to burn you the entire time. But God actually, that when you're saved, he actually sits there and he, by faith, sees all the things that you see, or all the things that you've done. He sees all the things that you've done. And that's what we need to realize, is that God, you know, more often you know, than not, is looking at the things that you do for his glory than at the things that, you know, where you mess up. Because he knows, yes, your spirit has been born again, it has been revived, but he knows that this flesh is weak, that this, that this, this body is going to sin. Until we get our glorified bodies, that's just, just the way it's going to be. So he knows that, and he, uh, he sees these things, and he's telling, you know, the, the, the Hebrews here, you know, the Jews here, that, you, you know, all stories that they were familiar with, all accounts that they know of, that all accounts that were in the Old Testament, or as they would just say, as that were in the Bible, because they didn't, to them, the Old Testament is all they have. And so he's telling them all these things and saying, you know what, this is how God sees them. This is how the Lord sees them now. 
And then, you know, let's look at verse 40. It says, God having provided some better thing for us. What better thing is that? Heaven. Eternal life. God provided a better thing. The hope of eternal life in which in this life we can't even, I mean, think, we can't even see, comprehend, understand, but we know in whom we have believed and we know in who, uh, in who we have placed our, our hope in and our trust in. That's in Jesus Christ, isn't it? That no matter, that we can sit there and, and, and keep wallowing in our self-pity about all the things that we didn't do right, or we can sit there and say, you know what, what am I going to do today? Because I can, I can guarantee that every single one of these that is mentioned was not waking up that morning saying, you know, I think I'm going to be used you know, for the glory of God. But they were open to the fact of them doing it. And the things that have happened here, you know, you know one's defeating the Amalekites and, and the Philistines and, and all. I don't, think that they, I don't think David woke up in the morning and said, you know, I think today I'm going to go pick a fight with a giant. But I am going to go out and I'm going to be used of the Lord. That was his, uh, that was his determination. That he, that he had. It's the same, you know, same thing with, you know, with others. I don't think Noah the one day was going, I think God's, you know, I think I'm going to go just build me a, you know, an ark for however many years to you know, uh, take care of the floods from rain that I've never seen before. It's just the fact of, are we open to the fact of what God would have us to do, of who God would ask us to speak with or speak to or talk to about something? Because you don't know, that conversation that you talk to can actually open up the door to where maybe, where maybe that's a person that's, you know, a leader that ends up seeing more people get saved or the fact that, you know, that they're, you know, by